So uh, we are happy to have uh, Matthias Gabadiel who has uh, accepted our invitation uh, to come and give a series of lectures on tensionless ADA CFD. Uh, Matthias Gabadiel is, uh, is a professor at ETH Zurich. And, um, and yeah, over to you, Matthias. Okay, well, thank you very much for the invitation. Obviously, I would have uh, loved to come in person, but uh, maybe some, some other time. Um, okay, so let me... So, so the aim of my lecture is to give you some overview of our recent developments in our attempt to understand uh, the ADS-CFT correspondence in the, in the tensionless uh, regime. And uh, so let me start very slowly by reminding you uh, of something probably most of you are familiar with, uh, what the ADS-CFT duality is in principle. So that's a, a correspondence or an equivalence of two different descriptions. One is a superstring theory on, say, ADS-5 cos S5, and I'll also be, be discussing lower dimensional versions of it. And on the other side, you have a conformal field theory, which people think of as being living on the boundary of the ADS space. So in the case of ADS-5, the boundary is a four-dimensional manifold. And on that four-dimensional manifold, the degrees of freedom of superstrings are captured by a gauge theory, more specifically uh, a young mills theory uh, uh, with gauge group SUN in four dimensions, and it has uh, n equals to four supersymmetry. Now, what's important to understand uh, what this, uh, how this correspondence works is at least schematically to understand how the parameters on this side are related to the parameters on this side. So we have to understand what's the dictionary between the two descriptions in order to see the power of it, but also the difficulties in trying to establish it. So again, this is something that's uh, probably familiar to many of you. Um, the correspondence is uh, of the kind that the, that the string coupling constant of the string theory on ADS5 or on any of these ADS spaces is inversely proportional to the rank of the gauge group. So, so we have, say, SUN, a super Mills theory, and the rank, the, 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 it's not the dimension of the gauge group. The gauge group has a dimension n squared minus one, but uh, it's a measure for how many commuting degrees of freedom it has. This number is inversely proportional to the string coupling constant. So if we are interested in sort of perturbative string theory, weakly coupled string theory, we'll always be taking the large n limit of that, uh, of that gauge theory. Now, as many of you are probably familiar, in the large end limit of a gauge theory, the gauge theory perturbation theory simplifies in that the leading terms come from the so-called planar diagrams. So they come from all the, the Feynman diagrams that you can draw on the sphere, and the one over n corrections systematically account for the contributions that come from Feynman diagrams that you can't draw on the sphere, but you have to draw on the Riemann surface of higher and higher genes. So the, uh, the, the, the leading large end behavior is uh, what's sometimes called the, the planar limit of gauge theory. And in that planar limit, in that large end limit, there's an effective coupling constant that characterizes the Young-Mills theory. And that's not the Young-Mills coupling constant, but it's this combination. It's G square Young-Mills times M. That's the effective coupling constant that appears at large end. And that's an old observation due to Tuft. And this uh, effective coupling constant at large n is uh, typically called lambda and is usually referred to as the Tuft parameter. So that's effectively the coupling constant of super mills in the large n limit. Now, the idea of the correspondence between the ADS string theory and the dual gauge theory is that this coupling constant is to be identified with the radius of the ADS space in terms of uh, string units. So the radius of the ADS space you should think of as the ADS space is some hyperboloid, and it's an equation of, 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 of the form minus x0 squared minus x1 squared plus x2 squared up to plus xd minus 1 squared is equal to r squared, and r is the parameter that I'm referring to here. It's inversely proportional to the cosmological constant that this ADS background has. ADS is basically uh, at the simplest solution to Einstein's uh, general relativity with a, comp with a, with a constant negative uh, uh, cosmological constant. And this parameter R is a measure for the size of this cosmological constant, or rather the cosmological constant is inverse proportional to this uh, radius R. The radius is also the radius 
of the ADS5 space. So, so the cosmological constants here and the radius here are correlated with one another in order for this background to be supersymmetric. And in any case, so this radius you should think of as being a measure for the size of the space in which you're considering, uh, the size of, of this uh, ADS5 cos S5 space. Now, the, the dictionary tells you that this size in string units, I, if you compare it to the typical length of a string, is to be identified with the TUF parameter, the effective coupling constants of the gauge theory in the large n limit. So one regime that's uh, uh, often being looked at is the regime where you are in the super, uh, where you think of it in terms of supergravity. So this means the space in which you are propagate the space, the background is much, much bigger than the typical size of a string. So LS is basically the typical size of a string and R is the radius or the size of the space in which the string propagates. So if the radius is much, much bigger than the string, then effectively you can think of the string as being a point particle. And then instead of dealing with string theory, you can describe this background in terms of supergravity. So the supergravity regime is where the space is much, much bigger than the string. The string is basically point-like, and therefore you can ignore the vibrational modes of the string. They're very, very heavy, and you can treat it in terms of supergravity. Now, according to this dictionary, if this is large as befits the supergravity regime, then that corresponds to the situation where the gauge theory is strongly coupled at large n. I'm always here at large n, i.e. string coupling constant being small. So what this tells you is that strongly coupled gauge theory, lambda being large, has a, an alternative description in terms of a supergravity description. And that's what people often refer to as a strong weak duality. So strongly coupled gauge theory can be expressed in terms of something that you can study in perturbation theory, namely supergravity on this ADS5 process 5 background. So this is good, this is interesting because it gives you access to strongly coupled gauge theories using some alternative description. And that is uh, one of the many motivations for studying ADS CFT because it gives you insight into a regime of gauge theory that's very difficult to access otherwise. So this is sort of part of the reason why people were excited about or are excited about the ads CFT correspondence. It gives you a window into strongly coupled gauge theory using some alternative description that you have under quantitative control, namely supergravity on say ads 5 plus S5. So this is great if your aim is to use the ads CFT correspondence to learn something new, i to understand strongly coupled gauge theory say, but if your aim is to prove the ads CFT correspondence, then that's a bad spot to be. Because if you want to prove the duality, you can't prove it if you don't, I mean, strongly coupled gauge theory, you don't have under any control. So if you want to show that both sides are really the same, then you can't start from a regime where one of the two sides, you don't really know what it is. So you have to, if you want to prove it, you have to look at a different corner of the ads CFT correspondence. And the idea is that, well, I mean, you don't really have much choice. On the gauge theory side, you really only understand super and Mills theory perturbatively. I, if you want to understand the gauge theory side, you have to take this parameter small. We probably still want to be at large n, so let's take the g-string uh, also to be small, and let's think about perturb the regime that it's uh, perturbative gauge theory. Now, that's fine. So the gauge theory side we have now under good control. But according to this dictionary, what this tells you is that the radius now must be small or stay of the same order of magnitude as the string length. So you, sh so you shouldn't take this, uh, this uh, proportionality too serious. So this proportionality is true when the radius is very large. And as the radius gets smaller, you would expect some sort of quantum correction. So you wouldn't expect this to be literally true that you should take the radius small relative to the string length, to the typical size of the string. But what you would expect is that the weakly coupled gauge theory should correspond to the opposite regime of the supergravity regime, to the regime where the string is relatively large compared to the space. Probably the string can't really get larger than the space in which it propagates. So you would expect this, uh, the, the perturbative gauge theory to correspond to a regime where the string is as large as it can get. And what this means is that the string tension, which is the force that would try to contract the string to a point, is as small as it, get, as, as it can be. So this is 
what people usually refer to as the tension lid on a string theory. So the string tension, the force that tries to contract the string and make it small is basically zero. And therefore the string is as floppy as it can be. And it basically expands in this space and is as, la as large as the space in which it propagates. So this is what this somewhat uh, schematic and qualitative picture suggests. What it suggests is if you want to understand the dual of big decoupled gauge theory, you can't go to the supergravity regime. You have to go to the regime where string, the string theory is tensionless, where the string has basically zero tension and is therefore very floppy. So this is an old observation. Um, and the idea of this observation, as I'll explain on the following slide, is obviously something special It's going to happen when the perturbative gauge theory becomes uh, the, uh, when the gauge theory becomes perturbative, when it becomes weakly coupled. Say at zero coupling, it's obviously a free theory. So it has lots and lots of symmetries. And somehow this must be reflected on the dual ADS side. So also something special should happen from the point of view of string theory and ADS if the gauge theory is weakly coupled or even free. And the idea is uh, what happens is that this is, a, this is the regime where this is the tensionless regime. And in the tensionless regime, new, new features uh, of string theory emerge. You, 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 you observe string theory to, to have a higher spin symmetry, as I'll explain uh, in a little bit detail later on. And it's, you should think of it as being the maximally symmetric phase of string theory. So you should think of it as the phase of string theory where the theory is as symmetrical as it will ever be. And you should think of switching on the tension as some sort of Higgs mechanism by means of which some of the symmetries that exist at this, this very special tensionless point get broken. So, so the, the basic tenant here is that the symmetries that are visible for weakly coupled or free super mills are also visible on the string theory side. On the string theory side, they don't manifest themselves by having a description of supergravity, quite the contrary. But there is some redeeming feature, something very special happening in this limit. And what's special happening is that the theory develops some gigantic symmetry and it, it, it's becoming more symmetrical. And as a consequence, because it's becoming so symmetrical, you would expect that it should also have a simple description of some kind. Now you can ask what sort of description, what sort of simple description could it have? Now, as we just explained, it can't have a description in terms of supergravity because it's the opposite regime. It's the regime where the string is very large. So it's not that we can approximate it by supergravity, but we really have to describe it in terms of string theoretic language. We really have to take string theory seriously, i.e. we have to describe it from the point of view of the world sheet. That's the only way we can describe a background that's extremely stringy. We can't, there is no way we can approximate it by supergravity. So what could you hope that the special feature of weakly coupled or free super mills could manifest itself from the world sheet perspective? Well, what you could hope for is that the world sheet description becomes very symmetrical, that the world sheet description exhibits additional symmetries, that it becomes maybe exactly solvable, maybe it becomes effectively free. So that's the basic idea. The basic idea is that when you try to prove it, given the fact that this theory is so special, has so many symmetries. There is this symmetry underlying here. Somehow in the honest string description, there should be something very special happening. And the special thing that should be happening is that you have a world sheet description that you can really have under control. Now, obviously at this stage, these are just words. This is just, uh, I mean, anybody is free to have a, a, a vision and, uh, that's maybe a plausible vision, but obviously we would like to see some more evidence for this idea being true. And what the aim of my lectures is, is to convince you that we actually have a lot of evidence for that. So before I get into the weeds, let me first give you sort of the, the bird's eye overview of what these lectures will be about and what I'm going to try to explain to you and what the sort of results are that we've managed to get. So, the first step was to realize that, so, so, so this is in some sense uh, independent of dimension. You would, I mean, this is so generic. This is true for ADS-5. It should also be true for ADS-3, whatever. So if you try to understand the world sheet description, you may think that 
maybe you should start from the simplest possible setup because if you can't do it in the simple setup, you're not going to succeed in the more complicated setup. So what's the si most simple concept, most simple setup where you have a chance for this sort of uh, dictionary and this sort of relation to pan out? Well, as many people are aware of, life becomes simpler in lower dimensions. For example, gravity in three dimensions is effectively topological. So string theory on a three-dimensional ADS space will be much simpler than string theory on a five-dimensional ADS space. So the first step is to try to see, okay, if this idea is true, maybe we should first try to understand it in the, in the laboratory, the, the more controlled environment of ADS3. And why is ADS3 better or simpler? Well, for a start, unlike the case of ADS5, we actually know the solvable world sheet theory for strings on ADS3 in terms of an SL2R resumino width model. And I'll review this uh, as we go along. This is due to work of uh, Maldicina uh, and Oguri around the turn of the millennium. And um, it's at least one ADS background you can study. Whether it's the ADS background that's relevant for what we are doing is a different issue, but at least there is one string theory that describes strings on ADS3 that we have under quantitative control. And if you know your conformal field theory, that's something you can really study in, in great detail. So that's one side of the advantage of going to low dimensions. The string theory in ADS3 is much more accessible, much more hands-on than string theory in ADS5. Now, the other feature, and in some sense that's mirroring it, is that the dual CFT for the case of ADS3 is a two-dimensional conformal field theory. And two-dimensional conformal field theories are under much better control than higher dimensional quantum field theories. I mean, there's a, as many of you may be aware of, in two dimensions, you have a gigantic symmetry. The conformal symmetry in two dimensions is infinite dimensional, the local conformal symmetry. And as a consequence, the symmetry constraints on 2D CFTs is much, much stronger than in higher dimensions. And that allows you to effectively solve two-dimensional conformal field theories using symmetry considerations. So there's a plethora of knowledge of detailed understanding of 2D CFTs, which are the CFTs that will play the analog of n equals to four super mills in the context of ADS3. And the string theory in ADS3 is under much better control than string theory in ADS5. So this is a place where you would hope that if this sort of general picture pans out, then surely you must be able to work it out for ADS3. If you can't work it out for ADS3, there's very little hope it'll go to work for ADS5. So that was sort of basically our, our working uh, hypothesis. So, so what's, the, what's the sort of uh, folklore knowledge about ADS3? So many of you will have heard the statement that string theory on... So, okay, so what's the analog of ADS5 plus S5? Well, the analog of ADS5 plus S5 is that you have to combine ADS3 with S3 to balance the flux. And then you put some four-dimensional manifold at your pleasure. And in order to end up with a space of maximal supersymmetry, you want to put the analog of a Calabi-Yau manifold in four dimensions. And that's basically T4 or K3. And we are going to concentrate in these lectures on T4 because T4 is simpler than K3. And our spirit is let's try to understand the simplest possible setup in as much detail as we can. If we understand that, then we can try to become more complicated, but our first aim is to identify a simple setup that we can really study and understand. Now, what's the analog of n equals to four super mills? What's the dual of it? Well, the dual of it is uh, a theory that I'll describe later on in somewhat more detail. It's what's called the symmetric orbifold of T4. So that's a conformal field theory that consists of T4, the T4 is just the four torus. So this is just a euphemism for saying four free bosons and four free fermions. So it's really a very simple theory. The bosons are maybe compactified, but essentially it's just four free bosons and four free fermions. And then you take N copies of them. So you have four N free fermions and four N free bosons. And then you take an orbifold by the symmetric group, by the permutations permuting the N copies among themselves. So this is the, what's called the symmetric orbifold of T4. And that's a very concrete uh, two-dimensional conformal field theory that we understand a lot about. Now, people often say the CFT dual of string theory in ADS3 ADS cross S3 cross T4 is the symmetric orbifold of T4, but that is a little bit misleading because 
there isn't really just one conformal field theory and there isn't really just one string theory in ADS3 cos S3 cos T4. So both sides have what you call moduli. They have three parameters that you can pick. So there are different choices for string theory in ADS3 cos S3 cos T4. And there are different conformal field theories that differ from the symmetric orbifold theory by what people call an exactly marginal perturbation, which means switching some parameter in such a way that the theory stays super conform. So the simplest example you can think of is, for example, you can take the torus and you can deform the shape of the torus. That's obviously not going to change anything of substance. So there isn't just one torus, there's a whole family of tori that I can deform and change the shape of. But there's also fluxes I can switch on on the ADS3 cos S3, or rather the tension of the string is a free parameter. And likewise here, there are free parameters in the symmetric orbifold theory. And from the point of view of this uh, CFT, what this means is there are exactly marginal operators, operators that don't destroy the symmetry, that sort of perturb the theory away from the symmetric orbifold point, the specific CFT, and still describe a conformal field theory that's sort of uh, related to it by a deformation, and therefore it should be related to this theory by a deformation. So the whole moduli spaces should map to one another. So the picture really looks a little bit like so. Here you have a moduli space of string theories, and I've captured this by this two-dimensional surface. In fact, the surface is much higher dimensional, but that doesn't really matter. It's some high dimensional space of theories. And the dimension here refers to say the radii and the angles and the string tension and so on. And in the CFT side, the theory you're looking at is the, is the symmetric orbifold of uh, T4 plus uh, uh, exactly marginal perturbations. So there's a question. Right, so, so I, I'm here, yeah, so one, one, one can get this description by starting from, from the D1, D5 system. So you take many, many uh, D5 brains and D1 brains, and you look at the near horizon geometry. And from that, you can read off that you're ending up with the symmetric orbifold of T4. But here, I'm just, I'm not going to use the brain picture at all. In fact, the brain picture will not play any role for us. The brain picture is really just a, a vehicle that lets you identify what the dual CFT is for string theory and this background by the usual Maldacena argument. I mean, if you look at the original Maldacena paper, he already explains it for ADS3 by starting with the D1, D5 brain system. But once you've done that, you just end up with the statement that string theory here on this space is dual to the symmetric orbifold here. And we are not going to use this brain picture in what follows. We are just going to take it at face value and trying to understand it. Okay, so the important point is that there is a moduli space of these backgrounds, namely the, the, the string theory has parameters and the CFT has the parameters. Then you would expect that every point here corresponds to a point here. And if you go to a different point, it corresponds to a different point and so on. So the whole moduli spaces correspond to one another. That's what people mean when they say the CFT dual of string theory in ADS3 cos S3 cos T4 is the symmetric orbifold. What they really should be saying is on the same moduli space of CFTs that also contains the symmetric orbifold. That's the more correct statement. Now, as I was alluding to before, in this CFT moduli space, there's one very specific point, namely the symmetric orbifold theory itself. And in the string moduli space, there is at least a line of theories, which are these solvable world sheet theories according to Maldicino and Oguri. So there are, there are two special places in this, um, in this moduli space that, that are in some sense preferred. And what wasn't known, and I'll explain to you, in fact, the reason why people had a certain bias about how it should be was, so you have the whole space here is related to the whole space here, but people didn't know what is exactly the dual of this point over here. And they didn't know what is the dual of this line over here. I mean, does it lie like that? Or does it go through this point? These are the things uh, people didn't know. You just knew that the whole moduli spaces are, that follows from the D3, D5, uh, D1, D5 brain system. Now, in fact, there was one generally accepted wisdom and the wisdom was that this point and this line are not related to one another. That this point is somewhere else than this line. So, say something like that this point is dual to here. That was the conventional wisdom. Now, why was that the conventional wisdom? 
Well, the conventional wisdom is that uh, that the well, uh, the, a, the the Western Mino Witten model description of strength here in ADS three equals three is the background is pure Nevis Schwartz Nevis Schwartz luck. So it's actually not. So when I said it's the D one D five brain system, I was well, I was lying a little bit. The D one D five brain system will give you the background with pure Ramon Ramon flux because the D brains have Ramon Ramon charge. In order to get the background with pure Nevis Schwartz flux, you would have to start with the Nevis Schwartz version, which is the combination of NS five brains and fundamental strings. That's in fact the reason why ADS3 is so special. I mean, ADS5 comes from D3 brains, but there are no NS3 brains. So there's only a Ramond version of ADS5, but for ADS3 cross S3, there's a Ramond version and there's also a Schwartz. In fact, there's a mixed version where you can switch on fluxes both of Nevis Schwartz, Nevis Schwartz, and Ramond, Ramond type. So that's part of the reason why ADS3 is so much simpler. And Probably also part of the reason why people thought that ADS3 may not be such a good guide for what happens in ADS5, but the upshot of my lectures will be that actually it is a very good guide, and that's what I'll try to convince you. In any case, the, the background, the Maldicino Guri background, is a background with pure Nevis Schwartz, Nevis Schwartz flux. So it has nothing to do with Ramon Vermont flux, it comes from the NS5 fundamental string. Large, uh, large brain. Well, it's not brains. It's the NS. Well, it's the NS5 brain. Many, many NS5 brains and fundamental strings in the decoupling limit will give you ADS3 cross S3 cross say T4 if they are wrapped on the T4 in the decoupling limit, and that's what this uh, Baldessina or Gori background is describing. Now, because it has Nevis Schwartz flux, there are solutions. There are string solutions that run very near the boundary of ADS3. So the ADS3 has the, has the topology of a cylinder, of a solid cylinder. So, the, so this is the cylinder that describes ADS3, including its interior, not just the two-dimensional boundary, the, the full cylinder, the three-dimensional thing. And string theory on ADS3 is basically string theory on the cylinder. And the strings can get very close to the boundary. So normally, you would think they would just collapse. But because of this Nevis Schwartz flux, the fundamental strings coupled to this Nevis Schwartz flux, and there is a compensating force. And as a consequence, this theory has what's called the long string solutions. These are solutions that run close to the boundary of the ADS space. So this is something which Cybergen Witten had understood, and then it also features explicitly in the description of Maldesina Onogori. Now, these strings, which run very close to the boundary of the ADS3 space, they are, they are very red-shifted. And as a consequence, the excitation on top of them, the excitation modes on top of these strings are basically massless. And as you get closer, they get more and more massless. So you're going to get the continuum of excitations of the, of the long string sector of uh, string theory in ADS3. So that's just a feature of the background with pure Nevis Schwartz, Nevis Schwartz flux. Because you have these long string solutions and because they're red shifted, you're going to have a continuum of excitations. But on the other hand, if you look at a symmetric orbifold, the symmetric orbifold has no continuum of excitations. I mean, you fix the torus, the torus has a fixed shape, then the spectrum is discrete, there's no sign of any continuum. And therefore, the conclusion was that this Maldesino Auguri background with the long string solutions that are there because it has pure Nevis Schwartz, Nevis Schwartz flux, can't possibly be dual to the symmetric orbifold theory itself. That's the sort of basic wisdom that everybody believed. And as a consequence, everybody believed that the symmetric orbifold will have nothing to do with the SL2R Vesumino Witten model under Maldesino Ogoro. Okay, so that's a sort of a factoid number one. We'll come back to it. Actually, there is a small subtlety to this. And as we'll explain later on, in the limit where the space gets very small, this sort of geometric argument breaks down a little bit. And actually, in the smallest setup, this continuum disappears. And that's the reason why it can match to the symmetric orbifold. But let me get there a little bit more slowly. Now, if you look at a symmetric orbifold theory by itself, what you notice is that it has a very large symmetry. It has a uh, what's called a W infinity symmetry. So from the point of view of two dimensional conformal field theory, it doesn't just have a stress energy tensor, it has a conserved a chiral spin three field, a spin four field and so on. So it has, and I'll explain that in a little bit more detail later on, what's called an extended higher spin symmetry. 
Now, this is really the analog of what we expect free supine mills to be. You see, free supine mills, if I really look at free supine mills, then this theory also has many conserved currents because it's basically a free theory. So therefore, the fact that our symmetric orbifold theory has this extended higher spin symmetry means that, first of all, we should think of it as being the legitimate analog of free supine mills in four dimensions. So in this moduli space, this point is the point which should be analog to free supine mills. The symmetric orbifold point is really the point that corresponds to free supine mills because it has this gigantic symmetry. Also, it's basically a free theory. So it's very plausible that this should be the analog of free supine mills. And furthermore, because it has this higher spin symmetry, it has this many, it has this higher spin symmetry, has this many conserved currents, and they are the analog of what you would expect to see from a tensionless string theory. So the natural idea is that the symmetric orbifold theory is the 2D CFT that's actually dual to tensionless string theory on ADS3. That's basically a consequence of the fact that it it's the analog of free super and mills, and it has all of these additional symmetry, uh, uh, conserved currents, which is exactly the feature you would expect to, to be visible from the dual of this tension, this limit. I'll, I'll explain a little bit more detail why this is so later, but that's basically the upshot of it. The upshot of it, by studying the symmetric orbit before you see, it has more and more symmetries than a generic point in this 2D, in, in this moduli space of 2D CFTs. And therefore, it should be the CFT dual to tensionless string theory. Now, if you look at it from the point of view of the Vesemino-Witt description, the tensionless regime, remember, is the regime where the string is as large as the space in which it propagates, or the space is as small as the size of the string. Now, from the point of view of this Vesemino-Witt models, the, the size of the space is basically the level of the Vesemino-Witt model that are explained in a little bit more detail later on. And therefore, the, the small radius regime should be the smallest possible value this level can take, which is k equals to one. k equals to zero is, a, is a, a theory that doesn't exist. I mean, there is no ADS and it's quantized. So the smallest level is k equals to one. So k equals to one is described some tensionless string theory in ADS3. And we've seen that a symmetric orbifold is the theory that wants to be dual to a tensionless string theory in ADS3. So if there is any relation between these two descriptions, the most plausible scenario is that the symmetric orbifold theory should be equal or equivalent to the theory with the smallest value of the level. And maybe with the smallest value of the level, this geometric description about the long strings will somehow get modified, and maybe there is a way that this will work out. And in fact, that's exactly how it works out. So. And this is, will be the first uh, two lectures uh, that I'll be giving, uh, probably the first two and a half lectures I'll be giving here, is to explain to you that this picture really pans out, that the symmetric orbifold is exactly dual to the string theory, the maldesino Guri type string theory, at the value of the, of the level that's equal to one, which corresponds to the ADS space being very, very small, being as small as it's possible i.e. the string being as tensionless as it's allowed. And we have a lot of evidence for it, and I'm going to try to explain this to you. So in particular, we can study the spectrum of this theory in detail. There are some special features that appear at level one that are different at higher level. There's some sort of, uh, it becomes a little bit uh, less geometrical, and uh, there is some very, very specific reasons why this theory behaves differently. And you can study its spectrum, and we can show that its spectrum matches exactly the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold, the entire single particle spectrum. And then we can also show that the correlation functions of that theory reproduce the correlation functions here. So we've really got very, very good evidence that this is a concrete incarnation of this general principle I was starting out with, namely that tensionless string theory of this, which this is an example, is dual to a free CFT of which this is the, 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 the 2D version. Right, so, so, so K, the level of these Vesemino-Witten models is basically the size of the space. When you take K to infinity, 
this becomes flatter and flatter, the, the, I mean, maybe I'll come back to it later on. If you look at the, um, the, the commutation relations of the affine Katz-Moody algebra, the affine Katz-Moody algebra commutation relations, um, maybe, maybe I'll, I'll sketch it a little bit. So the, roughly speaking, if you look at the commutators of two currents, they go like K times delta AB plus FABC times JC, schematically speaking. That's what the Katz-Moody algebra looks like. Now, when you take K large, so when you take K large, what this basically means is that you can drop this term relative to this term. This is going to become the dominant term. So K large basically means these things become free bosons because I mean, they don't have a commutator term, they only have the, 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 the quadratic term. And that corresponds to the, the space becoming flatter and flatter, the radius becoming bigger. So for example, if you do this for SU2, SU2 is the three sphere, and K is basically the radius of the three sphere. And when K goes to infinity, it beca basically becomes three space. And this, the commutation relations of these currents become commutation relations that look like free bosons. Also the central charge just becomes the dimension. So this is, so K goes to infinity is the regime in which the volume, the, the radius becomes very, very large. And therefore going to the opposite regime, going to small radius must mean going to K small. So that's basically the, the reason why the small radius limit, the tensionless limit, I mean, tensionless means the radius gets small in string units. Everything here is measured in string units. So therefore, the tensionless limit means the limit where the radius becomes small, and that should be the limit where k becomes small. Now you can ask, what's the smallest value of k you can have? Now for ADS3, you could have any value you like, but because we are looking at ADS3 cross S3, and for the S3 factor, the level is quantized and has to be an integer, and the two levels have to be the same, you learn that the smallest possible value is k equals to one. So that's basically, the, the picture, again, you see K being the radius is a statement that's true for large K because that's sort of a effectively a supergravity statement. So the extrapolation to small K, you don't exactly know what's going to happen because you're going to in the regime where this correspondence is going to break down, but you know that tensionless will mean small K because you know large radius means large K. So then you go to the smallest value of k and that is k equals to one in this context. So I think what I'm trying to, to argue is that if there was any way this could have worked, it can only work like that. I mean, there is no guarantee that it has to work because who knows whether the symmetric orbit fold is in fact dual to a pure nervous schwartz and schwartz background. In fact, that's against what people expected. So maybe you shouldn't expect any duality of this kind, but if there is a correspondence between these special Maldesino or Gori backgrounds and the symmetric orbit fold, the only chance it really has is for the smallest value of k. And that motivated us to study this example in detail. Now, this is the ADS3 cross S3 story. And I think this is, we have a very good control. We have lots of evidence and it works, I think, uh, very convincingly. So this is one data point in this attempt of proving ADS CFT. I think in the, in the three dimensional case, we can more or less declare victory. I think we've really identified a world state theory that's exactly due to the symmetric orbit fold. And there are many, many things we can compare and everything works, seems to work on the nose as one would hope. Now, as I'll explain to you, so once you've identified this level one theory, you can look at it from all sorts of different points of view. And there's one point of view in which it's very naturally described in terms of free fields. This is not the Maldesino Oguri description. This is the so called hybrid description. And I'll come to it later on. And it's in terms of uh, what people call symplectic bosons, but this is really a beta gamma system and free fermions. And you have to quotient by some, but let's not be too worried about the details at this stage. Now, what's remarkable of these three fields is that they seem to play the role of twister degrees of freedom. Again, I'm not going to explain to you in detail what the twister description is, but let me just mention that, they, that the way the space-time coordinate appears from the point of view of these three fields is the way you would expect this to happen in twister, string, in twister theory. And given the fact that people have tried to find 
a twist. I mean, n equals to four supernumerals has a nice twister description, and people have tried to find the sort of string theory analog. This description actually suggests a rather natural generalization to the case of ADS5, where you're basically trying to sort of mimic what worked for ADS3 and combine it with the sort of twister ideas that people had for ADS5. And together with uh, Rajesh uh, earlier this year, I'm not sure whether you can you can you can see the bottom of my screen. Um, we we proposed a concrete a concrete description, a concrete generalization, starting from our ADS3 free field description and putting it together in a way that's very reminiscent of this twist down analysis. And what we've managed to show is that there are gaps in our argument. There are many things we haven't quite understood, but there's a very plausible way in which you can say what the physical uh, state uh, should be. And if you follow your nose, what you find is that the physical states of this world sheet theory reproduce exactly the single trace spectrum of n equals to four super mills. So I think this is a very good indication of the fact that we are somehow on the right track to solving this problem, not just for ADS3 because S3, which we've more or less done already, but that these techniques are really telling you something interesting also about ADS5, and that ADS3 is actually a very good model for what will happen in ADS5, because this free field description generalizes uh, pretty naturally to something that you would think should be associated to ADS5. And then if you analyze its spectrum, you realize that you reproduce exactly the single trace spectrum of free n equals to four super mills. So at least the spectrum seems to be correctly reproduced by this world sheet here. So this world sheet theory, I think, has a very good chance of allowing us ultimately to prove ADS5 plus S5 for, for, uh, uh, at the free point. And uh, that's what I hope to touch upon towards the end of my lectures. Free bosons in world sheet. So I'm not sure I really understand this question. Um, large k, I mean, we are looking at the small k limit here, right? So, um, yeah, so I'm, I'm not 100% sure. So, I mean, there are, these, there are these PMS symmetries and all the rest of it, but the question is, what is exactly dual to n equals to four super mills or the 2D CFT? And I think, as Sundberg pointed out many years ago, that should be the tensionless limit of string theory. And from a world sheet perspective, that should happen at small level rather than at large level, because that's what small radius means. Now, there may be other corners, one may get something that looks vaguely similar, but I think an honest, look, I mean, here we are going to get an honest description between a full world sheet theory, the full physical string spectrum, and the full spectrum of the 2D CFT, and hopefully likewise for the full spectrum of a uh, free single trace spectrum of free n equals to four super mills being reproduced by the full string spectrum of a specific world sheet theory that we are going to write down. So that's that's what we are aiming for. We are aiming for an, 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 an honest description between uh, both sides. So uh, yeah, the flat the flat limit is is delicate because you're you're somehow in the in, in the highly curved regime. So I don't quite know what the flat limit is going to be. I mean, if you think about it, so the, the ADS3 space is tiny. Or think about ADS3 space may be hard to visualize. Think about it in terms of the three sphere. The three sphere will have radius one. So the three sphere is actually very, 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 very curved. And it's not clear to me how this is very close to anything that looks like flat space uh, string theory. It seems to be really, in some sense, the opposite limit. And in fact, what underlies all of this, or many of these things, is that, as many of you may know, straight, the SU2 Westermino written model or string theory on a three sphere, when the radius becomes of string length, is actually equivalent to a single circle. So it doesn't look at all like a three sphere anymore. So it's the, the ideas of this geometry, as I was arguing before, the the free supine mills limit will correspond to the regime where geometry is not really a good guide because we're going to look at a regime where the space is really tiny. It's of the same size as string of the string length. So it's very stringy. All our supergravity intuition, we have to be extremely careful about because we are really in the limit where 
the space is tiny rather than large. And therefore, I don't really see how it's directly related to flat space. But as you also see here, you see there are free fields appearing in this world sheet here, but they're not the free fields of six dimensions. There are free fields that live in some twister description. So there is some effective free field description, but it's not related to the geometry of flat space. And that seems to be the lesson that uh, is working here. And I don't think one can go directly from these descriptions to anything like flat space holography. I think flat space holography is really infinitely many far away from what we are discussing here. Okay, so this is basically my extended introduction into the bird's eye view of uh, where we want to go. And so the aim is that uh, uh, we, I, I spent uh, most of my lecture explaining to you in detail the ADS3 CFT2 case. So I'll first explain to you where this higher spin symmetry, how this fits in, why the symmetric orbifold theory should be in the right place. And then I'll explain to you how you describe this world sheet theory. And I'll do this in two, two takes. So take number one will be technically a little bit simpler, which is this um, basically the maldesino Oguri theory. I'll just explain to you what happens to the maldesino Oguri theory at level one. Now, this is a little bit subtle. So the honest, more honest way of doing it is by going to this hybrid formalism of Berkowitz, Waffer, and Mitten, which is believed to be equivalent to Nervish, Bortz, Vermont. And I'll explain that to you in a little bit of detail. And then, uh, and then, after showing that the spectrum matches, we are going to study the correlation functions. And I explained to you that the correlation functions match. And hopefully that should convince you that this duality for the case of ADS3 really, really works. And you and really has both sides under control and can check it. And it really is under very good control. And then depending on time, what I want to do towards the end is hint at you how this generalizes to ADS5. What are the sort of lessons that will continue to work for ADS5? And what's our proposal for how this could work? And this really requires this hybrid formalism. It's really the hybrid formalism that has a very natural generalization to ADS5, which leads to these twisters. And the twisters is what happens naturally when you look at these correlation functions. So I need all of this in the buildup to motivating why what we have proposed, we believe is a reasonable proposal and we believe has a very good fighting chance to reproduce, to be the world sheet description that is due to free super mills in four dimensions. Okay, so let me start by explaining to you this, uh, the higher spin symmetry. So, so, so what's, what's the general picture of the higher spin symmetry? So remember, we are interested in the tensionless limit. The tensionless limit means that the, the, the string becomes very floppy. I mean, the string tension is really the thing that makes it small or if the tension is high and if the tension is small, then it's floppy. Now, if you do string theory, you see the particle spectrum is really the excitation modes of the string. So what happens to the excitation modes of the string if the string tension becomes very small? Now, I mean, you know, if you play the violin, if the tension of the string, the higher the tension, the larger, the higher the tone the smaller the tension, the smaller the tone. In the tensionless limit, basically it costs zero energy to excite the string because the, the force that would force it back is proportional to the tension, it basically goes to zero. So the string becomes very, very floppy. And what this means is that the, that the higher uh, vibration modes of the string become more and more massless. So in the really tension, in the zero tension regime, what you would expect is that all of the the excitation modes of the string, so the things that you would normally, so the things that you would normally associate to say some powers in, in flat space to the, to the alpha minus mode say, they will all become, correspond to massless degrees of freedom in, in the target space because the string tension goes to zero. The, 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 the contribution with which the stringy modes contribute to the space time mass goes to zero. So people, uh, and, and, and sometimes, uh, as, as you know, string theory states lie on these ratchet trajectories and that the mass is proportional to the spin. I mean, basically, the mass is proportional to the excitation number and the spin is proportional to how many oscillators you've excited. And in this tensionless limit, what will happen is that these, all of these uh, degrees of freedom on the string will become massless fields in space-time. So you end up with a theory in space-time that doesn't just have a massless graviton, which you always have in string theory, 
but they'll also have a massless spin three field, a massless spin four field, a massless spin five field, and so on. Now, what are the consequences of that? Now, you know that every massless field will come with its own gauge symmetry. So the fact that you have all of these additional massless fields means that your theory will have many, many more symmetries than just uh, the diffeomorphism invariants. I mean, the uh, general covariance of uh, general relativity will get boosted to a much, much bigger symmetry, which this uh, space-time theory will have. And this is something which people have studied uh, long ago. Uh, I mean, there were various no-go theorems about whether there are any interesting such higher spin theory, but it, it was uh, Vasiliev who uh, showed that there are interesting interacting higher spin theories that have this gigantic gauge symmetry. I mean, the, the reason why you may be suspicious is because you, if you have too much symmetry, you would expect your theory to basically be trivial, to have no non-trivial interactions, no non-trivial scattering. But what Vasiliev showed is that there are, you can have at the same time, these gigantic symmetries, which come from these many, many massless higher spin fields, and still have an interesting theory, at least if you are in ADS in, or, or the sitter. If for him, it wouldn't matter whether it's anti the sitter or the sitter, but you needed some cosmological constant in order for these Vasiliev theories uh, uh, to, to work. And they were sort of circumventing various no go theorems, uh, telling you that these massless higher spin theories would all be, be essentially trivial. But in any case, what's important for us here is that this theory will have these many massless higher spin fields and it therefore will have a, an enormous gauge symmetry. And you would hope that you can characterize this theory in some sense by its symmetries, that the symmetries will be so powerful as to constrain the theory uh, very, very much. Yeah, I'm not sure whether it's topological phase. I think it's... Uh, I mean, it's some subsector of the theory that has this gigantic symmetry, and then the symmetry will constrain it. I'm not sure whether it will constrain it uh, to, a, it, to what you may want to call a topological phase. But the idea is certainly that all the interactions have to respect that enormous symmetry, and therefore many, many things are much, much more constrained. And it's in some sense the maximally symmetric, maximally unbroken phase of strength theory. As I was saying earlier, it's, it's like when you study the standard model. You want to study the standard model before you switch on the Higgs field. I mean, the Higgs field breaks the gauge symmetry and at zero Higgs field, without the Higgs field, the gauge symmetry is unbroken. The, the theory is much more symmetrical. And likewise here, this higher spin symmetry means that you have many, many symmetries in your theory. And that's the sort of place from which you probably should start because that's the place where you have most control over the theory. Now, this Vasiliev theory is really only meant to describe a subsector of string theory. It's really meant to only describe the leading ratchet trajectory. There are many, many additional degrees of freedom in string theory that have to sit in representations of this gauge symmetry, but that are not described by this Vasiliev theory itself. Maybe the Vasiliev theory itself is some sort of decoupled, and maybe that's what, what Pronovesh meant, that this is some sort of decoupled topological sector that uh, in some sense closes among itself, that is uh, potentially true. Although I think the honest answer is that nobody has really studied this in any detail. I mean, in some sense, we should be able now to study this because we know where on the world sheets these fields sit, but I'm not entirely sure it really decouples in any uh, natural way. In any case, what's important is that this is really only a subset of string theory then the leading ratchet trajectory is captured by this Vasiliev higher spin theory. And from the gauge theory point of view, these are the bilinears of the elementary young Mills fields or the bilinears in the symmetric orbifold. And what this is, is a sort of baby model of uh, ADS CFT, where you're not looking at all the stringy degrees of freedom and all the gauge theory degrees of freedom. You're only looking at the bilinears on the gauge theory side, then you're only looking at the leading ratchet trajectory on the string theory side. So this is, uh, this is what was proposed uh, around the turn of the century by, um, by Sundberg and then by, by, by Witten and then uh, uh, Klebanov and Polyakov made a proposal for what this simplified uh, higher spin uh, CFT duality could look like. So this is, not, this is not derived from string theory. So the idea was that if this ADS CFT stringy duality is true, then it probably should also contain some sort of higher spin subsector, which is just the thing captured by the Vasiliev theory. 
And a, a piece of the gauge theory, namely basically the bilinears, which you would expect to be something like a vector model. And this by itself should somehow be dual to one another. But it wasn't clear how this is related to string theory. People just said, okay, if ADS CFT is true, there should also be a version of the duality that looks like that. So let's just see whether we can write down a proposal for a duality of that kind that seems to work. And uh, Klebanov and Polyakov, and then subsequently Siskin and Sandel looked at at uh, models of this kind. So uh, they looked at uh, bosons versus fermions and free interacting theory. So there are various variants and, uh, and, and they made proposals for what sort of Vesalia theory should be dual to what sort of a vector model. In, and in their case, they did this for ADS4 being related to the 3D or in vector model. So this has been, uh, this uh, was uh, around uh, 2002 and then this lay dormant for many years. And then it really got revived through the work of uh, John B. and Yen around uh, 2009, 2010, who, who took this seriously and tried to check this proposal in more detail. So they really calculated, uh, they compared the correlation functions which you can calculate in the O and vector model relatively easily. And they compared them to calculations that are very difficult because they involve this Vesalius theory and the Vesalius theory is a, a very complicated uh, setup, but they managed to find a way of calculating three-point functions in this Vesalius theory and show that they match with the three-point functions of the Owen vector model. And that triggered a certain amount of activity. People identified the symmetries and understood this a bit more conceptually, but the upshot of this was that this higher spin CFT duality, there was very good evidence for it to work, and in some sense, that supports general ADS CFT because it shows that this uh, Vasiliev subsector and uh, the leading ratchet trajectory of string theory and the bilinears of the vector field somehow match one to one another, although they are, they are far from the full stringy description. Now, as I was saying uh, early on, uh, what Roger Schneid in mind was to try to go to lower dimensions in order to understand the ADS-CFT duality. So you can also ask, what's the lower dimensional version of this higher spin uh, CFT duality? And what we proposed was that the uh, higher spin, the Vasiliev higher spin theory in ADS-3, um, that is somewhat more easy than in ADS-4, that has effectively, it's a Chen Simons theory based on some infinite dimensional Lie algebra. And we propose that this is dual to a specific two-dimensional conformal field theory. And this two-dimensional conformal field theory, the fact that this has many higher spin degrees of freedom manifests itself in the 2D CFT by the fact that this has a W algebra symmetry. So I'm not sure how, how much people are familiar with what a W algebra is. I mean, a conformal field theory means you have a real Soro algebra. That's the local symmetries of the conformal transformations. And a W algebra simply means you have many more additional chiral fields that organize your spectrum in terms of representations of this extended algebraic structure. So you don't have just have a the spin two currents, which correspond to the stress energy tensor. You also have a spin three current, a spin four current, a spin five current. They all have their modes and they give rise to a gigantic W algebra that constrains the theory much more than just the Vera Sora algebra would. So you, you may know some superconformal symmetry. So superconformal symmetry makes this conformal symmetry a little bit bigger. And the W algebra is in some sense an orthogonal making bigger of the symmetries where you're not adding fermionic degrees of freedom, but you're adding more and more bosonic symmetry generators and they form some consistent uh, set of, uh, of, of symmetries. It's, the mathematical term is a vertex of greater algebra or a chiral algebra for physicists. And that is the the boundary imprint of the fact that the bulk theory has a higher spin symmetry. The higher spin degrees of freedom, the massless higher spin fields in the bulk become chiral fields on the boundary. These are fields that are purely left moving or purely right moving and therefore generate the analog of what the stress energy tensor looks like. Anyway, I'm not going to go, I mean, this would be a lecture series uh, in its own right. It's also a little bit dated. This is more than 10 years ago that we observed that this duality works. I really just want to use this to motivate why the symmetric orbifold is so special. So, so because this is, um, this is in low dimension, and as I mentioned before, in low dimension, you have much better control. So in particular, the three-dimensional higher spin theories are much simpler. They're really just Chern-Simons theories. Uh, 
And 2D CFTs in particular with W symmetry, there's a lot of literature on this subject. So these WNK minimal models, you know exactly all the possible representations, all the conformal dimensions and all the rest of it. And then when you take this larger limit, you still have control over that. So that allows you to make many, many precision tests for this duality and this duality work very beautifully because we could identify, say, the quantum symmetries here and match it with the quantization of the symmetries here and so on. So there's lots of detailed ways in which you can check it. And again, this is a, a general reflection of the fact that life in lower dimension becomes simpler, becomes more concrete, it becomes more accessible. And this is another incarnation of this fact. Now, this originally was the bosonic theory, it had nothing to do with supersymmetry, but in order to make this make any contact with the super string theory, we decided to also study the supersymmetric version of this, um, of, this, uh, <clears throat> of this higher spin theory. And the supersymmetric version, there's a supersymmetric version of higher spin theory on ADS3. That's a trans-Simons theory based on a certain super Lie algebra, which has a name that I'm not going to explain to you. It's a certain infinite dimensional super Lie algebra but it's sort of the natural supersymmetric generalization of these Vasiliev uh, higher spin theories. And then we found some corresponding, the analog of the WNK minimal models are these Wolf space cosets, and there are certain conformity theories that I've written down the coset description for you here, but it won't play an enormously important role in the future. This is more to show you that there's really a very concrete dictionary also in the supersymmetric case, and we know exactly which 2D CFT that's on the boundary is dual to which higher spin theory in the bulk. Now, the key observation uh, that uh, we had uh, uh, in 2014 was the observation that these wolf space cosets, so if you, if you look at these CFTs, so, so here you should be careful. So here there's also a level. Now this level has absolutely nothing to do with the size of the ADS space. Here we are always in some sense in the large, so, so here, here we are in this uh, tensionless limit. So, so this level has nothing to do with the level I had earlier. So the earlier, the tensionless limit was level one here. This is true for any value of K and N, but we take K and N to infinity to match to the higher spin theory. So this, is, this level plays a very different role than the other level. In fact, what plays a, an important role is the ratio of n over k or n over n plus k plus two. And uh, this has to do with the fact that this has actually large n equals to four superconformal symmetry. And there are lots of details, which I don't really want to get into. But the upshot of it is that when you take the limit lambda to zero, which corresponds to taking k to infinity, and let me emphasize this is not the k that is the level on the world sheet theory for ADS3 that plays a very, very different role. This has nothing, this is not the world sheet CFT. This is the dual CFT. This is the CFT on the boundary. If you take this level to be large, what you find is that these wolf space cosets basically become free fields modulo a UN symmetry. I mean, if you're a little bit familiar with this Vesumino written models in the level, the limit where K goes to infinity, as I described earlier, you see this, the, the commutator terms just become basically free bosons because the commutator term, there's a K times delta AB term and an FABC JC term. And for K large, the delta AB term dominates. And therefore this becomes basically free bosons and free fermions. And then the fact that you had to divide by this just means that you're ending up with free bosons and free fermions subject to some global constraint. And what you find is that you're really ending up with a four N plus one free bosons and fermions in this limit modulo a UN constraint. This is basically what the denominator here of this coset provides for you. Now, the UN constraint and the Symmetric, so the symmetric orbit fold, if you replace one, you have four N plus one free bosons and free fermions, and you will look at the invariance under SN plus one. And what you observe is that SN plus one is actually a subgroup of UN. That's uh, not that difficult to see. And therefore what you learn is that somehow 
this uh, the chiral fields of this Wolf space caroset are a subset of the chiral fields that appear in the symmetric orbifold of T form. You see, here in the symmetric orbifold, you have more fields because you only demand that they're invariant under the symmetric group. In the Wolf space caroset, you demand that they're invariant under the unitary group. The unitary group is much bigger than the symmetric group. So everything that's invariant under the unitary group is in particular invariant under the symmetric group. And therefore, all the things that survive here are naturally part of the symmetric orbifold theory. So that's quite remarkable because it tells you that the symmetric orbifold theory actually has this gigantic W symmetry inside it. And the W symmetry is the hallmark of it being due to a higher spin theory. So this suggests that if the 2D CFT that's the symmetric orbifold contains a CFT that's dual to a higher spin theory, well, that must mean that the string theory that's dual to the symmetric orbifold must be one that contains a higher spin subtheory, i.e. it must be tensionless. So that was the, the important insight that made us realize that a symmetric orbifold really is the tensionless point, and therefore, if it has a string theory dual, it should be a string theory dual that's at very small radius because that's where the tensionless regime is. So, so this is what, uh, just summarizing what I just said. This viewpoint suggests that a symmetric orbifold is dual to string theory at a tensionless point. And therefore, if we want to find the string theory description of the symmetric orbifold, we have to look, we have to use world sheet methods. We have to, we are far from the supergravity regime and we have to try to see what sort of a world sheet theory has a chance to describe this tensionless limit. And as I argued before, if you believe that maybe you are lucky and the Western Mino written models a la Maldesina and Oguri will somehow allow you to access that corner, then you should look at the, the small level limit of these Western Mino written models. That's the place where you should look for. I mean, there's no guarantee that this is going to work, but if it is going to work, that's your best bet. That's basically the upshot of this analysis. The upshot of this analysis is that if there is a chance that you will find the, um, the, the, the world sheet description that's due to the symmetric orbifold, you should look at a small level limit of the Wessomino written description of string theory in AD history. So in order to explain that, let me now, so this is basically what the higher spin theory tells you that where you should look, and now we have to look. So now we have to work out the spectrum of ADS3 in the regime where the level is small, namely for level one. And in order to do so, I first have to explain to you a little bit what this world sheet theory of Maldesino Oguri looks like. And then I'll explain to you how we calculate the, the space time spectrum from it. Now, please interrupt. So this is going to become a little bit uh, more technical now. So please interrupt me when I go too fast and I'm happy to explain things in more detail. Okay, so let's, let's start slowly. So the, the perturbative list, so this Maldesino Oguri theory is basically a description of string theory in ADS3. Originally, they described it for bosonic ADS3 theory. For the case of bosonic ADS3 theory, it's just the Resumino written model associated to SL2R level K. And I'll explain to you what this theory sort of looks like in the following slides. Now, we are interested in the supersymmetric version of it. And therefore, we should start with what's called the n equals to 1 superconformal super affine algebra. And I don't want to go into the details of it, but the reason why this isn't that important is whenever you have such an n equals to 1 algebra, super affine algebra, so what this means is you have currents and you have fermions in the adjoint representation, then you can, this algebra is isomorphic to a bosonic algebra together with three fermions that are decoupled from this bosonic algebra. So thinking about the Zuzi version is basically the same as thinking about the bosonic version plus adding in three fermions in the nevis schwartz fermion description. The only small subtlety that happens, and that'll play a, a bit of a role later on, is that the level that appears here gets shifted by the dual Coxter number. So the level of the bosonic algebra, if the level of the original superconformal algebra was k, the level of the bosonic algebra for the SL2 factor will be k plus 2. And for the SU2 factor, it will be k minus 2. Anyway, let's forget about the SU2 factor. Let's first concentrate on the SL2 factor. So I, let's concentrate on ADS3. And as I've just explained to you, it doesn't really matter whether you think of it in terms of superstring or string theory in ADS3. 
it's always, uh, this is the tricky bit you have to understand. Three fermions, we all know how to do. So let's concentrate just on the bosonic Westromino witten model based on SL2R. Okay, so what? So SL2R is basically SU2. So uh, it'll be generated by a generator J plus minus and J3. So these are the generators of SL2R and the commutation relations will be something like J3M, J plus minus N is plus minus J plus minus M plus N. I mean, it looks basically like SU2, except it's this different real form. And as a consequence, uh, J plus M with J minus N is minus two times J3 M plus N. And then you have a central term plus Kelta, uh, Delta M minus N. So what's, uh, what's uh, unusual is this minus sign here. This minus sign is because we are dealing with SL2R rather than SU2. And then you have, uh, finally, we have the J3, J3 commutator. And this is equal to minus K over two delta N minus N. And again, this sign, I mean, here there would be a normally a plus for SU2 and for SL2, there's a minus here. That's the only difference. So this is the SL2R affine Katsmudi algebra. And then your space of states, what does it look like? You start with some representation of the zero modes. You see the zero modes just form a copy of SL2. Oh, sorry, I forgot to, importantly, there's a factor of M here and M here. So if you look at the zero modes, then this uh, factor is zero and this factor is zero. So you just have the usual normal SL2R algebra. So the states of your Fox space of your Hilbert space or whatever, but it isn't actually quite a Hilbert space because this is a has is non-unitary because it describes the time-like direction of string theory. So this shouldn't be a unitary CFT because it's like Minkowski space with a time-like direction. That's also not unitary. Um, but the way you can describe the spectrum is that you pick some representation of the SL2R zero mode algebra. So you restrict the mode numbers to zero and you just get SL2R. And then you just build the usual Fox space on top where you just apply all the negative modes on top. <clears throat> so in terms of flat space, this is like the alphas, and this is like the momentum ground state that parameterizes the different, uh, I mean, in, in flat space, you would write down something like alpha minus M N1 times mu one, going to alpha minus mu L minus NL, and then you would act on some momentum state. So the way you think about it, the alphas are like the J's, and the momentum is like, the, the, well, because this is curved this space, the Fourier analysis is a little bit more complicated, but basically you can think of this as being the analog of the momentum ground states of your flat space string theory. So now you have to, so that basically describes all the states that your theory will have, but we obviously have to explain what sort of, what sort of representations of this kind appear. And the only variable here is really to say what sort of representations of this kind appear. You see, once you fix that, then the rest is just the Fox space that you make by applying all the negative modes. There you have no choice. So in order to say what's the spectrum of your, of your conformal field theory on the world sheet, i.e. what combinations of momenta appear in your spectrum, you have to say what are the representations of SL2R that appear in the string theory description of, uh, of this background. And then, and this was done by Maldesino Gori, I mean, geometric considerations, basically looking at a large level limit, suggest that there are two kinds of representations that survive that really follows from the Peter Weil theorem. You just look at L2 of SL2R as a group manifold, and then that can be expressed in terms of matrix elements of certain representations of SL2R. And these are the representations of SL2R that should appear in your spectrum. And what this tells you is that there are two classes of representations that appear. Those that are called discrete series, the lowest rate representations and continuous uh, series representations. So, so what's happening here? So, so here we have a, so the Casimir of SL2 is uh, given by minus J3 zero J. So for the zero mode algebra plus a half times J plus zero J minus zero plus J minus zero J plus zero. That's the Casimir. And you characterize the zero mode rep the representation by giving you the level of the Casimir. So just like for SU2, you describe them in terms of some sort of spin. So J tells you the value of the Casimir. I fixes the eigenvalue of this combination that commutes with the whole of SL2R. 
And then the other parameter is M3. So you, you choose the convention that J3 on this state is just M equals to this state. So this is like SL2, SU2. So this is familiar probably to most of you. The only difference is that for SU2, you are familiar with the spin, the finite spin representation that have dimension two times the spin plus one. For SL2R, the representations that appear are all infinite dimensional and they, they either look like so. So they're either discrete series, the lowest weight representation. So if you draw them, uh, what do they look like? So if you draw the, the J30 eigenvalue, actually, I don't need this, um, I don't need this axis. I just draw the J30 eigenvalue. So they will start at some value J and then J minus is zero. So they would populate all the points over here. Right, so you have, you have, that's the state JJ, and then that's the state JJ plus one. If you apply J plus to it, you get J plus to it will be proportional to J, J plus one and so on. So it looks exactly like the SU2 representation, except it's not bounded between J and minus J, it starts at J and runs off to infinity. So these are the discrete series, uh, lowest rate representations. And then the other representations that matter are to the so-called continuous series representations. And then if you draw the corresponding diagram here, they are, they are such that they actually are unbounded in both directions. So, so, they, are, so they get populated with steps by one to the left, but they also get populated with steps by one to the right. So they never stop in either direction. And they're characterized by the value of the Casimir and they're characterized by alpha, where alpha tells you the value of any one of these eigenvalues more than integer because J plus and J minus shift the eigenvalue by integers. The only thing that's invariant is the fractional part of that eigenvalue. So if I draw some, say uh, the zero line here, if this is zero, then this would be alpha. Alpha is the, the value of the smallest guy between zero and one. And then all the other ones have eigenvalues that differ from alpha by an integer. And the value of the Casimir that appears for these continuous representations is such that it takes the value of a quarter plus p squared, which if you write it in terms of j means you take j to be a half plus i times p, where p is real, because if you plug that in, then you just get a quarter plus p squared. So what Maldesino Gori showed was that the correct spectrum of string theory in ADS3 is given by looking at the space of states where you take representations of SL2R and you take the affine representation. So, so you take uh, reps affine representation. So they have all the Fox space. They act on some ground states. And the ground states that you pick, they either sit in discrete series representations or on continuous series representations. And you always pick the same representation for the left mover and the right mover. So you get a direct sum over all the discrete representations, both for left and right movers with all their affine stuff on top. And then likewise for the continuous series. That's the spectrum of string theory in ADS3, according to Maldesino Ogori. And that comes geometrically motivated from uh, the Peter Wall theorem that at large level, that's all the representations that you will need. Can other types of representations be lifted to reps? Well, they, they could, yeah. I mean, this construction you could also, this construction you can do for any representation of SL2, right? I mean, you just, I mean, this will give you a representation of the affine Katsumudi algebra. That's really, Nothing that can go wrong. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't have probably said so, but I, I simply define this by saying that the positive modes kill this space. So that's a bad convention for n bigger than zero. The zero modes act as the zero modes and the negative modes generate the Fox space. So that surely generates a representation of the affine Katsumudi algebra. And this you could do for any representation uh, that, that you want. There's nothing, there's nothing specific about these representations. You can do it for any representation, but when you construct your conformal field theory, you always have to declare what representations actually appear and how are left moving and right moving representations related to one another. And it follows from these geometric considerations, namely the Peter Weil theorem for SL2R, that these are the representations that should appear. That's the analysis of Maldesino or Gori. Now, actually, that's not the complete analysis because there is a, there's a bit of a subtlety here. So the subtlety has to do with the fact that 
in flat space string theory, you have to prove the Nergos theorem. You have to prove that once you've imposed the reverse Soro condition, your spectrum is unitary. And you can try to do the same for ADS3. And you find there is a so-called maldesino augur rebound, which tells you that the spin of the discrete representation, the discrete series representation is bounded between can't be bigger than k plus one over two. That follows from the Nergos theorem. So this is, has to do with the curved nature of this SL2 space. Now, what Malzina Oguri, so this would seem bizarre because that would basically mean there's a finite string spectrum. And what Malzina Oguri observed was that these representations that I've described for you so far are in fact not the only representations that appear in the vector space of this 2D CFT. This vector space of this 2D CFT has some additional representations and they are not just these highest rate representations. And geometrically, they come from the fact that, as I mentioned to you, remember there is these long string solutions. And for the long string solutions, those that run near the boundary of ADS, they naturally have a winding number. And the solutions I've described so far really only describe the winding zero solutions, so they describe the short strings. And you will also have solutions that, uh, that uh, wind around the um, wind around the boundary of ADS and they will be described, they have a winding number. And if you translate this into the language, into this algebraic uh, language, what it means is that you're not ending, you're not getting highest rate representations, you're getting additional representations. And these additional representations are what are the so-called spectrally flowed representations. And I want to explain to you a little bit what the spectral flow representations look like. Now, this is a little bit technical, and this is something many people find confusing. But if you think about it clearly, it's actually not that complicated, but it requires a little bit of getting used to it. Now, what are the spectrally flowed representations? So the idea is we start with our familiar highest rate representation of the kind I've just written down. So you should have in mind these are the representations that are generated by the terms of the form. So that's the, that's the vector space of the highest rate representation where these are all negative, non -negative uh, the minor ends are all um, positive integers. The zero modes move you on here and you produce the full space. But this is has a, has a bounded L0 spectrum because these states are highest rate. They're killed by the positive modes of the J's. Now, the idea is that you generate new representations by using an automorphism of the algebra. So, the idea is we, de we define, so, so on this space, we let the tilde modes act. So the tilde modes, so I should have written here tilde modes. So we have the tilde modes act on that space. And now the idea is we define another action. So we could define the action in terms of the tilde modes, then we just have the standard high straight representation. But what we do is we say, we define new modes and the new modes are expressed in terms of the tilde modes and some numbers. And because they're expressed in terms of the tilde modes and some numbers, we know how these new modes act on this space because we know how the tilde modes act on this space. So this clearly defines for you the action of these generators on this space because you've explained what they are in terms of the tilde modes and the tilde modes just act in the obvious way on this space. But because this automorphism is non-trivial and particularly it moves the mode numbers, the resulting representations will not be highest rate representations when you interpret them with respect to these new generators. So let, let me illustrate this a little bit. So, so suppose we start with one of these continuous series representations. So what this means, and here I've drawn the full affine representation. So I've got the, the J3 tildes, the J3 tildes. So this is the line going infinite in both directions. This is what describes all of these states Jm with m running from alpha plus any integer up to plus infinity and up to minus infinity. So these are the, these are the ground states, right? These are the ones labeled by Jm. And then if I apply all of these negative modes, well, each of these negative modes will increase the conformal dimension. So they will lie somewhere up there and they have some SL2 charge. So they define some dots in this diagram. I'm not meant to say here there's only one state for each dot, but all the states have quantum numbers with respect to J30 and L0 tilde that are described by one of these dots. That's sort of the caricature 
of, uh, of this representation space. Now remember, on this representation space, we now define some new action, where the new action is defined in terms of the old action by this redefinition, which is exactly this redefinition. And to be concrete, I'm going to concentrate on the case k equals to one and w equals to one. So there was a k over two here, there was this k squared here, they not just become one, and there was a, actually there was a factor of w here and a factor of w squared here. So these things have now just become one. So this is a, just a simple, a simple version of it. It doesn't really matter. You could also do it for in the general case, but let's not worry about it. Let's just do it in the simplest case. Now, what happens when we do it in the simplest case? Well, what we should think about is what, what is the L0 eigenvalue of all of these states, right? I mean, these are the states. We know their eigenvalue with respect to L0 tilde and J0 tilde. So we can calculate their L0 tilde, L0 eigenvalues, and we can calculate their, their, their J3 zero eigenvalues. So if we do this, you see L0 will look like that. And the, and, and, and the line with L0 equal to zero will run along here. You see that the states with L0 equal to zero are basically the states for which the L the tilde eigenvalue is equal to the J3 tilde eigenvalue up to a constant. So if I make the J3 tilde eigenvalue positive, I also have to make the L0 tilde eigenvalue positive. So for this difference to stay constant. But you see, if this is the line L0 is equal to zero, up here L0 will be positive then obviously down there, L0 will be negative. So what you, said, what you learned from that is that once you've redefined your generators in that manner, the spectrum is, doesn't have an unbounded, is unbounded with respect to L0. So, the, so normally for these highest rate representations, the L0 spectrum is bounded from below and you have all the affine excitations that lift you up. But in terms of these redefined generators, the L0 spectrum is unbounded from below. Now, that is a feature and not a bug, because you see, that's exactly what's also true in flat Minkowski space. You see, remember in flat Minkowski space, when we look at these, uh, when we look at these oscillators, we look at these states P, but P is a momentum in Minkowski space and the conformal dimension L0 on P is basically a half times P squared and this can become as negative as you want. So flat string theory, string theory in flat space also has an unbounded L0 spectrum. And in fact, we need this because remember, we have to solve the physical state condition. The physical state condition is L0 is equal to one. If P squared was bounded from below, that would basically mean we can only have finitely many excitations because after we've added all these excitations, the total L0 is still meant to be equal to one. So in order to get an interesting string spectrum, you need the fact that the L0 spectrum is unbounded from below. Otherwise, you're only going to have finitely many excitations. And this spectral flow is producing exactly these sorts of representations. And geometrically, what they mean is that you're basically including the winding sectors along the boundary. And you need that in order to get the full string spectrum uh, that looks anything like a string spectrum. So, you should think of this as really being the very natural analog of what you're familiar with, namely string theory in flat space where the L0 spectrum is also unbounded below. And so it is here. So there's all these states with negative L0 eigenvalue, but this is really what we need in order for this to give us anything that looks like a string spectrum. And it's very well geometrically motivated by including the representations that come from the Peter Weil theorem plus including the winding number around the boundary of ADS3. Okay, so this is the, the spectrum of your conformal field theory. And then in this conformal field theory, you have to do whatever you have to, what you always have to do in flat, or, or what you also have to do in flat space string theory, you have to impose the physical state condition and the physical state condition say in a nervous sport sector will be that you demand the positive super conformal generator, N equals one super conformal generators to kill the states. You also have to require the positive Allen generators to kill the states, but that's implied by this condition. And then you have to impose the mass shell condition that the L0 eigenvalue is equal to a half. So for example, in the sector with, without spectral flow, what does this condition mean? Well, L0 is just the conformal dimension of the ground state, which is the Casimir of SL2 divided by K, plus the excitation number, 
then you have the excitation, you have the conformal dimension and excitation number of the rest that's also included in N in H0. So this would include the SU2 factor and the T4 factor. And then this has to be equal to a half, which is this a half here. So what we have to do is we have to look at all, so I've described for you what the ADS3 factor is. We know what the S3 factor is and the T4 factor is. And now we just have to analyze all the physical states, all the states that satisfy this condition and enumerate them. And that will tell us what the space-time theory will look like. And that we can do for any value of K, but in particular, we can do it for K equals to one. And what our aim is going to be to do this analysis for K equals to one and figure out how, what degrees of freedom the space-time theory has. Now I'm running a little bit out of time. So let me just close by uh, saying, um, saying one thing, and then I'll, I'll stop. So the space-time theory, we, we want to organize the space-time spectrum so that we recognize it as a conformal field theory. I mean, the space-time spectrum is meant to be another conformal field theory. So in particular, we would like to keep track of the conformal dimension with respect to the space-time theory. And the basic uh, idea is that the Möbius group of the space-time theory is just the zero modes of SL2R on the world sheet theory. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the physical states, i.e. the states satisfying these conditions, but we are going to keep track of the eigenvalue of J30 because the eigenvalue of J30 on the world sheet will translate into the conformal dimension of the corresponding state in the 2D CFT. And what I'll explain to you tomorrow is how to do this analysis systematically. I, we take this world sheet theory that I've described to you in quite some detail, we look at the physical states and we enumerate how many of them have which eigenvalue of J30. And that will tell us what's the conformal dimension of the states that appear in the space-time CFT. And what we want to do is we want to match that to the spectrum of the symmetric orbifold. And tomorrow I'll explain to you that if you do this at, at level k equals to one, which is where we expect this to could work, we actually reproduce exactly the spectrum, the single particle spectrum of the symmetric orbifold of T4. But uh, my time is up for today, so that's why I'll continue tomorrow. Hello. So yeah. So are there any uh, questions? Um, comments. That's okay. Yeah, you can either raise your hand or. Okay, right in the chat. Okay. Um, so I don't see uh, any questions. Um, so then, you know, like, um, let us thank uh, Matthias uh, for uh, this nice lecture. Uh, so we are meeting again uh, tomorrow morning at uh, nine o'clock Indian Standard Time uh, for the lecture by Professor Simon Gordon Huat. And, um, and yeah, uh, so, so thanks. Yeah, see you guys then. Bye. Oh, sorry. So there's a question. So, so when you say from the CFT side, do you mean uh, the symmetric orbifold or do you mean? So. Yes, yeah, so in, in, in fact, uh, yeah. So what we'll see is that the spectral flow will become the twisted sector of the symmetric orbifold. So the twist, so I'll, I'll explain uh, tomorrow what the twisted sector is, but the twisted sector is basically the symmetric orbifold, as you go around, you only have to come back up to a permutation. And there's a natural set of permutations, the single cycle permutations, which is the analog of the single trace operators, are those that come back to um, up to a permutation by a cyclic group of uh, type W. And if you think of it, that in some sense describes a W fold winding. And that is going to be exactly dual to the winding number or the spectral flow from the point of view of ADS. So the, the winding around the perimeter of ADS becomes the unwinding in the symmetric orbifold of, of T4. But we, we'll see this more explicitly tomorrow.
Okay, are there any other questions? Uh... <clears throat> so was this too slow? Should I go a bit faster or what do you think? Um, yeah, well, I, I thought it was okay. Um, I don't think it was slow, but. Uh, you mean I, I was too fast or I was, uh, if anything, too fast? Yeah, probably, you know, like somebody who's a student should say, because I, you know, uh, I'm a bit. Yeah, I mean, you have to give me feedback. I mean, I can only change if you give me feedback. If you don't give yeah, me any yeah, feedback, so, I'll just continue like today. Yeah, so maybe, you know, like, uh, yeah, among those who are there, you know, like the audience, you know, like maybe uh, what do you guys think, you know, like can write in the chat or. Yes, uh, write in, well, the chat will probably disappear soon, but you can write yeah. in the, what's, what's it called, the. Um, Slack, yeah. That's also the. the that's Slack, also, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's also Slack. Uh, I can uh, I, I can create a channel uh, for uh, uh, yeah for your talk and and uh, and yeah and, and probably you know like uh, it would be much more uh, useful. Uh, I guess I'm a bit biased because I think I've you know, had this before, so so it's very difficult for me to yeah. Right. Uh, sure. Yeah. Okay. Good. So then uh, then I'll see you tomorrow. Yeah, yeah, thanks, Matthias. Yeah. Okay, so so please, please, you know, like if you have any further questions, feedback, please leave it in the Slack. Uh, just create a channel. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I'll, 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 I'll look at the Slack channel as well. Yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, thanks. thanks. Yeah. Thank uh, you. Bye bye. Bye.